Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to this beautiful room. Uh, it's truly my honor to introduce uh, the next keynote speaker, Dr. Yi Bing Wu from Tomasic, which is a global investment company based in Singapore. Uh, Yi Bing has truly an uh, illustrious career, and a few minutes of introduction here only allows a very sketchy account of many of his accomplishments. So Yi Bing was a uh, undergraduate student uh, at the University of Science and Technology in China, that's a top university in China, where he majored in molecular biology. He then received his PhD degree in biochemistry from Harvard. And Yi Bing started his career with McKinsey, rising to become the senior partner and head of Asia Pacific NNA practice. He was also general manager of McKinsey Beijing, advised a large number of leading Asian companies in the international expansion effort. And Yixin then joined, uh, Yixin then joined the Lenovo Group, serving as chief strategy officer, chief integ integration officer, chief transformation officer, and chief information <laughs> officer of the Nano Group, a lot of hats. He led the acquisition and the integration of the IBM PC business by Lenovo. He was later appointed to Lenovo's parent, Legend Holdings, as executive vice president, where he was responsible for the overall business operations and overseeing its direct investment business. So in 2009, Yibin became the president of a private equity funds management of the China International Trust Investment Corporation, also known as CITIC. As you may know, the CITIC is one of China's biggest conglomerates with one of the largest foreign assets in the world. Concurrently, uh, Yibin served as chairman and CEO of a Goldstone Investment Corporation which is an investment arm of CITIC. So in 2013, Ibn joined Tomasic. Under his uh, uh, leadership, he with the capacity of joint head of uh, portfolio strategy and risk group, and also he's a joint head of Tomasic China. So Ibn also has a Yale connection. He is a member of uh, Yale's um, Asia Development Council. So formal introduction aside, Ibing Chule is a Renaissance man with diverse interests and talents. Uh, my conversations with Ibing were seldom on investments, but mostly on arts, science, society, and life. And uh, he truly impressed me that not only as a great um, investor and business uh, developer, but also a scholar and intellect, a visionary, and most importantly, a wonderful human being. So I don't know exactly what Ibn is going to tell you today, but I do know that whatever he's going to tell you is going to be very enlightening. So with this, I represent uh, Dr. I present Dr. Ibn Wu to you. Ibn, please. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Hai Fan, for that introduction. I think. Uh, really, there's a, one bit of self-introduction I should make, and why I'm standing here is I was a failed scientist and a, a lousy investor. So my friend always said, why would, you quit, why would you quit science? The world potentially lost the scientists, and I had one more lousy investor, which the world doesn't need. So still to this day, I had to explain to mom, my mom, and after PhD, I was joined McKinsey. And he said, what exactly is McKinsey? What exactly is management consulting? I, I thought you want to be a professor at some university. So I still have to explain that to him. So my only wish is that uh, you know, maybe something that you know, I do today by investing in early technology uh, in life sciences, maybe I can pay back some of the debt I owed uh, to great universities of the US. Um, so that would be a, a start. How do I click O, oh, maybe? So the, the, the whole thought of this come from my various conversation with my good friend with Haifan and, um, and the Yale University. Uh, the history was, was actually, we have a group of friends of Chinese CEOs. We always go, 
uh, ski and uh, play poker together, and then we decided we said we got to do something like more productive, and um, so uh, rather than just you know spending our time have fun together, so we decided it's a good time for people in our age to go come to the great uh, U.S. universities uh, to learn what's new and what's great. So last October, it was last October, right? Um, yeah, the, the October before, yeah. Um, so we came to Yale, um, and uh, we were truly impressed by really the great research, particularly in life sciences. And this is, you know, my uh, return to glory with all my technology friends. I can explain to them secondhand what I just learned about life sciences. Because none of them understand all the details of the technology. Every day when we go back in the buses, they say, can you explain to me in the language I can understand what we've just been talked about today? So I have to do the secondhand resale of what we will learn in today. But uh, needless to say, that sparked great interest uh, among you know, all different investors about how great really the research and then the potential to translate into uh, discovery and medicine that is and particularly uh, facts like in Yale something like 60 percent of the budget and and the faculties are in uh, medical and life sciences research those are facts even like Ho Ching um, the Tomasic CEO didn't know and was quite impressed so the whole out of the whole um, week we repetitively hear one sentence is actually one phrase is the valley of death um, obviously there is a great disconnect between the great research the early research uh, that the university has done and to what becomes an investable company uh, by venture uh, by way of introduction for those um, wasn't here in the morning. Um, Tomasic is about a $200 billion asset under management. We invest both across the board from uh, uh, as late as public market to as early as venture companies. And also 10% uh, of our fund, of our uh, total managed asset uh, is uh, investing in funds. So we do sort of, you know, invest in uh, venture and, and uh, private equity funds that extends our research, uh, extend our reach into different aspects. And so we got to see um, the, the different uh, stages of the development. And indeed, uh, what we see is the disconnect um, between the early research uh, and what has become investable. So that sparked a lot of uh, discussion and thinking I had with Haifan and the university, and which is the leading into uh, today's discussion. Um, so that's why we thought about, is there any way that we can help to make research more efficient and help to fill part of the de valley of the death. Obviously, that's a great interest today. Uh, you know, as you heard, the you know the the great visionary such as Blood uh, I keep having problem with pronouncing the word Blood Vinick Fund. Uh, you know, it's doing uh, you know great things in fill that valley. Um, so um, part of the things that we thought is maybe there is more that can be done to help to bridge this. So um, just a few of the, uh, the, um, the, the stats, the biotech industry, obviously, as you can see, has go through a, you know, the, the era of really innovation uh, era. As you can see, the, um, the, every year, the new drug and the, uh, uh, the new drug approved both in number um, and continue to go up. However, the latest breakthrough is likely to um, transform the um, healthcare landscape. As you can see, um, there is a lot of technology, both from a regulatory point of view and from technology breakthrough, and particularly in the most recently, the convergence between life sciences and technology, right? In things like um, you, you heard this morning about parallel sequencing, which is semiconductor with life sciences, and now particularly with artificial intelligence being very prevalent now, uh, you know, in across of different industry and in research, that really what we can see is uh, uh, driving a new era of the innovation. So that. Being said, what we can see is also the R&D uh, investment continue to go up, um, this both in pharmaceutical and in biotech industry. However, here's the key problem. The R&D productivity continue to decline. This is across the industry, right? So not specifically to any of the cycle. Uh, in, in any 
the, the cost of developing a single molecule really has, be, be, the cost has gone up. And if you ask the reason why this is the problem, uh, really has a, a few of the issues. One, to start with, now we're cracking a lot harder problems, right? So now, you know, the disease we're dealing with, cancer, neurodegenerative diseases, you know, hepatitis C, or now I have been into hepatitis B, those are all tough academic problems. And then second is really the regulatory has evolved so much, which we'll have data to show, then the regulatory uh, the environment is much tougher. And obviously the R&D costs continue to go up. Uh, and then lastly, you have traditional pharma uh, R&D productivity, which used to be, I would say, one of the major engines driving innovation has become less efficient. Uh, that's because these companies are growing much larger and much more complex and then maybe I'm offending a few of my pharma friends, and the industrialized drug, drug discovery approach, well, you know, pro provides a lot of efficiency boost, but also as in people who manage large companies before have a lot of internal bureaucracy, let me just say this. Uh, and then uh, that's why a lot of pharmas now has to outsource a lot of the, uh, um, the, the, the research. And those are all factors that are driving what you can see, the, the, uh, the forces that will have the slight in the R&D productivity. So this is uh, just a few numbers to back it up. As you can see, uh, the red line, this really is the uh, cost of a single new molecule, uh, new molecular entity has shot up tremendously uh, from the early 90s to today. And uh, really to tackle this problem, new partnership models are needed. I think that's uh, one of the key uh, when we looked at the partnership between you know, biotech uh, and uh, the pharmaceutical companies. And then this really has sparked the thought and can we extend that partnership early on into university research, right? So when you look at the involvement of the pharma and biotech research, it started with uh, traditional pharma essentially doing one company, one investigator, doing everything. So my PhD advisor, Mark Tashney, and he was the early founder of Genetics Institute, right? So uh, on, on the East Coast, and this you know, had the whole rivalry with the Genetech, one molecule, that was the, uh, the human insulin, right? So, and then, you know, that really sparked the, the, the whole generation of biotech, but that model really has become uh, more and more difficult because the time and capital required, as I will show, become much larger. However, when you're coming into less experienced entrepreneur, I keep telling most of the Chinese entrepreneurs, and then you, if you want to, starting from one molecule to all the way to drive a sales force, you know, to sell your molecule, which is still, many of them think that way, it's basically impossible, right? So, you, you know, you don't have the patience and time and, and the capital and the skills required. So that's why you have a lot of uh, really new ideas coming into it. Um, open crowdsourcing, for example, has been, you know, examples I put on the right, right hand side. Uh, it's one approach. Uh, academic centers of excellence, a lot of farmers now are, are you know, essentially um, exploring the, the great intellectual capability of the universities. And the biotech co creation, um, you know, pharma companies very commonly start their biotech investment arm, their venture arm, um, so that, you know, for example, Lily with the uh, uh, Lily Asia Venture, um, the, the GP is my good, my, my good friend, and we're actually investing in that fund, and Sanofi, et cetera, those are just a few examples. And lastly, uh, the pharma start to have innovation centers, right, creates essentially regional centers across the board so it can leverage the best talent, best talent uh, and the um, the being really plugged into the local ecosystem. And those really are the new partnership models that has coming into place. So now our thoughts has been, how could you extend that partnership model? What could be a new partnership model in academia research? This come back to, um, you know, I, I mentioned this in the morning. Uh, in my days as a research in Harvard, uh, I spent all the days to do mini preps myself, you know, putting the vortex by hand, you know, and then, you know, load the sequencing gel. Those are the old days, right? So, and then run the, the sequencing by self. It's really today when 
you know, I have the perspective of both industry and the investor, that's just about the, one of the most inefficient process in terms of scaling up discovery. However, it is great in academic freedom, as you said, this is the strength, uh, basic research, really need that academic freedom, you need that touch, you need, you know, I think the daily loading gel uh, torture really was a uh, time for me to reflect. And then, you know, as I said this morning, and then you have, you know, some of the great ideas come. So I'm not saying all the postdocs and PhD students should quit the lab and just you know, ask the CROs to do all the work for themselves. But however, if you're talking about translational research, I would argue universities are poorly re equipped to do that because you have the wrong type of people, right? Because a postdoc student come to Yale or, or a postdoc or graduate student come to Yale, you pick the smartest people in the world. They have the most ambition. What they want to do is use the academic freedom, use the great facilities and you know, interact with the great people in this audience and come with the innovative ideas. Most commonly, that will be identified a novel target. So once the target is identified, you want them to come back with you know, screening hundreds of thousands of entities to repeat that things again and again and again. You know, I remember my lab days, that's not my, my favorite time, right? So I can do that you know, all this time by my hand. Yesterday, you have parallel sequencing and all of that, but you don't have the efficiency, you don't have the discipline that industry has. So I think that's the complementary strength um, um, that I think the, the industry and the uh, uh, academic um, really have. And I've seen very few really productive inter in the collaboration really in the idea would be how do you really do efficient division of labor? How do you make the truly innovative part still retain that in the university and while you can keep the IP and leverage the industry discipline, the process and, and the cost of labor, right, to do that. If one can do that, that would be a, a probably a part of the, the way to fill the valley of the death. That's my key thesis today. To fill the valley of the death is not just capital that's needed. You know, you can, because I will show numbers, as you can see before, a new entity now costs billions of dollars. Right? You can have tens of millions, you can have hundreds of millions that are spread around and to, to do one more step. You can mature that target. Right? You can probably establish the essay. This is my good friend. I'm stealing the framework from my good friend Li Ge, the, the chairman and founder of uh, uh, the Wuxi uh, Pharma Tech, Wuxi App Tech. And then what he said, I actually make a lot of sense. This is out of uh, our you know, class and last year in discussion with uh, our friends at Yale is if the academ academia centers can establish the essay and then you can leverage the industry to repeat that essay, right? So I think that's a nice, play, nice break, if you will, right? So and then you, know, you can continue to come up with the new essays and then the industry can continue to repeat that essay. I think that probably would be a nice division of labor and I think we're in the process of testing that. Oops, there we go. So another reason that you needed better collaboration across the ecosystem to, to fill the valley of the death of translational research is to really to have a innovation breakthrough needs more than great science. The great science is a, the foundation, is what's absolutely needed. I'm not trying to diminish the importance of that. As I said, my whole talk is trying to you know, redeem <laughs> you know, my failure before. However, you know, what has become apparent, and this is you know, very commonly recognized now, you, in, in addition to you know, the academic freedom and the great science you would need, you really, to do the translational research, to do repeat the essay many, many times, you do need the industry, industrialized tools and industrialized process. And the disciplines, the big companies in repeating the essay in a very precise way uh, is very important if you really, really want to scale up uh, the translational research. And you need business acumen. This is not just about you know, if you have a great essay in the lab, in the lab, you really need to design to say, where do I want to take my molecule, right? So what's my end game? 
You know, it's my, you can design a company, you know, target it and say, I want to out-license my, my molecule in phase one. You can say, I want to take this thing all the way to phase three. And the approach you take in terms of, for example, in a company, how many molecules you need. You know, do you need a combination of best in class and first in class? And do you need some Me Too drugs so that you can have some early wins? And those are the, the, the debates that we have with some of our portfolio companies. So that, how could you essentially in creating the company already in the early design, make it more investable by a venture, right? Or, or, or an investor because, you know, the capital does have both requirements. You know, one is everyone wants to get a blockbuster, to, you know, you have the early venture, you make, you know, a thousand times return, but on the other end, everyone hates to lose principal, right? So, and uh, how could you, you know, balance those things? So those are part of the business acumen, and then you can help to design and create this company. And lastly, you needed different type of capital, right? Because there are vent ventures or not ventures. There are some ventures who is familiar with one specific stage. There are some ventures, as I mentioned in the morning, who is more familiar with the specific geography. There are some ventures who is more specific uh, with specific industry. Really, how would you find the right capital for your design of the right company? And really, I think these are the four factors that needed really to foster a breakthrough in translational research, building on top of great science. So, and really, uh, as you say, the good news is you have large and growing uh, the venture capital investment in healthcare. So I don't need to um, explain the chart in both in number of deals and in capital that continue to increase. And you do have strong demand for innovative pipeline. And that's the good news. So the capital coming from today is not just from venture capital firms or invest firms like us. In, a, in the industry firms and even more importantly, most recently more and more biotech firms are looking for in license. And by the way, look at the right hand side, in license really now increasingly come from all stages, right? They don't just Yes, traditionally pharma company in license in market drugs. Now they go early and earlier. You can go phase three, phase two, phase one, preclinical. Now you have blockbuster in license deals even in preclinical or in discovery stage. And then because really the appreciation for science has really permeated, you know, throughout the value chain of the industry. And because of the pharma company realize more and more importantly, they need in, li in license. When biotech companies grow larger, they also, this value chain of, how we call it, the market of the intermediary has become very, very mature. Uh, this morning I talked about, it's very important to recognize, and one of the major advantage of the US as a market is you do have a complete value chain uh, in, from the early discovery all the way to um, taking it to the market, and there is a very mature intermediate market, right? As in, you can out-license at any stage. And now that value chain is maturing outside of the United States. So uh, and I said, uh, one of the things that become very apparent to me is China today, for as an example, has an entire value chain now. And one of the major, um, one of the questions this morning is, what was the major disadvantage China had, I would say even as five years ago, it doesn't have a mature intermediary market. So that's why the, some of the Chinese ventures have to really to go take from the early stage all the way to drive into the pharma company. Now, really, you have that intermediary market. I'll show you some examples. Right? So another um, breakthrough is really the maturing of the CROs. Right? So, and then the contract research organization really can help to bridge the gap between the providing really an independent tool and independent uh, processes. So one of the theses I would like to um, you know, promote is really if CROs can help to reduce cost and increase efficiency for pharma companies, for biotech companies, why shouldn't academia to think about how do we leverage CROs to increase our translational research. So that's an important part because as you can see, the academia 
is excellent in certain aspects, but however, come to what we said, the parts that's needed in translational research, which if I simply put, it's repeating the same experiment tens of thousands of times, really probably it's better done in a CRO and most likely in the lower cost jurisdiction, right? So, you know, Wuxi Pharmatech, for example, has tens of thousands of masters and PhDs, right? So, and then they're coming from China, the cost is much, much lower than a graduate student, and then they, are the, they hire the right type of people who are not bored, right? And they have the entire industrial process in repeating that experiment. So if there's a way to promote that collaboration, um, that would be help one of the ways to, to increase the efficiency. So there are early examples of that, and some of the professors you know, on the right-hand side, for example, as you can see, uh, Greg Verdine is using, uh, collaborating with uh, Wuxi PharmaTech on basically using the example is he has this protein help to permeate, um, you know, carry drugs inside in the membrane uh, so that he can deliver can anti-cancer drugs into that. And then obviously in, in experiment is if you want to establish as a platform company, you want to, you know, try as many compounds and as, as many uh, targets as possible to build into platform company. And that is basically impossible to do if you build a, a platform company with the, uh, to, in the lab to scale to that scale. And then that's probably a natural candidate to do it in collaboration with the CRO. And uh, so as an example, so as would say, did you have taken as we see as example for the industry, a large number I mean, they have built the company into essentially a platform. You can see as in 2017, 46, 36 out of 46 entities at some stage have gone through their labs. So the number basically has illustrated the CROs now has become global. Now the CROs also has become global standard. As in, this is one of the innovation, as you can say, why in translational research, this morning I made a comment and said labor has become global, is or if you want to arbitrage the cost of labor, lower cost of labor in China, you don't need to establish your lab in China. You just need to you know, find a global CRO that has its presence you know, in China, right? So today, really, that's why my thesis this morning I mentioned is really innovation has always been global, I think will increasingly global, is that because the three key component has become global, right? So one is the capital has become global. As this morning I made a comment as it really is hard to distinguish what is Chinese money, what is Singapore money, what is US money. Um, and then also the talent is global now, right? So Haifan is a uh, you know, great professor here, and then also he has collaboration you know, in China, and then even labor, the lower level skilled labor, and by the way, um, those are not really lower level, they're a master and, and a PhD of life sciences, a student, uh, even with Pharmatech, now they are at service of the, the uh, globally. So really what we can see is the key trend uh, in, you know, for the future, is really you have the refocus, people have refocused back into the basic research. Um, so all the pharma companies and biotech companies have realized the most important is the fund, fundamental research because you really, you want to have an innovative drug, you have to all, all the way back. Uh, I made a comment this morning um, and China already in the CFDA process has about 30, you know, PD-1, and I made a joke. I said PD-1 essentially today has become a newer generic, right? Although it's a new molecule because the target is so established to engineer a new molecule that become an antibody of the same target become an easy process, particularly if you have, you know, CROs that's as efficient as it become. So it, to really to have a true blockbuster drug, and you really need to identify novel targets, which is what I've seen a lot of posters today, you know, coming to that, uh, right? So the pharma and biotech company has realized that because some 25 of those 30 people who are filing PD-1 probably eventually will not get approved, you know, in China because, you know, they would say, once you have five, why do I need more? <laughs> right? So it's just more generics. 
uh, and, uh, and innovation really has gone global, I made that comment before, and then really you have the open R&D platform, and those are open R&D platform will continue to grow, and they will enlarge, and they essentially pro provide a level playing field, right? So, and this is both good news and bad news. The good news is, you know, when I went back to China as a research, uh, graduate from PhD in 1996, I could not do my experiment that have been done, you know, in the U.S. Today, a scientist in China, even if he's never educated in the U.S., could do the same level of research if he had a capital and an idea, because Wuxi can do it for them, right? So the, the vision of Wuxi is essentially creating an intermediate capital market and market for the research. All you need to is design a molecule, give it to them. They have the established asset, they can do it for you, right? So I think that really has uh, you know, globalized uh, the, the whole research process. And Asia, um, just uh, I mentioned this morning, has become a, one of the innovation engines. And this probably is a little bit you know, aged. Um, as you can see, Japan has always been one of them. You know, the PD-1, for example, um, is one of the major contribu contributors Japanese. And now, really, this is as of last five years, I mentioned this morning. And China has become an innovation center, went from a what traditionally viewed as a manufacturing center. So um, really, I've seen the Chinese companies uh, really over the last 15 years went from generic focused to a me too drug focused in the last four or five years to be a, a me better drug focused. And today, many of the innovative companies taking one, Lily Farm, uh, I'm sorry, Innovent, for example, and they now are able to not only taking into clinical trial a me better you know drug for example their PD-1 is out licensed um, you know to um, um, uh, out licensed to Lilly and this is one of the uh, major um, you know breakthrough a, a US pharma company is in license from a Chinese startup of a molecule you know back into their portfolio uh, and may, in their portfolio now, they also have first in the, the, the class, um, you know, molecules now. Really, you've seen the curve of innovation going up in a tremendous way. One of the key reasons this is, uh, um, we alluded in the morning, as Chinese authorities really fundamentally overhauled its regulatory to promote innovation. And CFDA essentially has reformed it to be like FDA. Right? So they've gone, they, they have accelerated uh, the approval process. Now, just taking one example, we put it there. Uh, they have 60 days from filing to trial if no objection. You know, before part of the problem is you file, you never know when you get, you know, uh, they, and anyone would read your file. Today is if they don't respond to you, they don't say no in 60 days, it's approved. It's all become automatic. That's how extreme the change has been. Um, obviously, they're raising the quality standard um, for, ge for generics. Now they require by equivalency test. And then most importantly, they reduce the regulatory barriers. Um, one of the most important for uh, global uh, biotech and pharma companies, really the overseas clinical trial data has become acceptable. You know, before they require, even if you have gone through uh, phase three, when you, uh, uh, you know, go into China, they say you have to redo phase one. And you know, we can do it faster, but you have to do phase one because you know, Chinese are different than you know, ethnically, which a lot of it we know it's not you know, totally true, it's just red tape. And now they can accept you know, global data, so essentially you can truly run global multi-center um, you know, trials. And that reform has unleashed innovation uh, and excited both multinational corporations and the Chinese companies. So that's why I made the comment this morning uh, now you really have a parallel universe now. 
you know, in China uh, along the entire value chain, and which, by the way, is going to drive a whole set of innovation, not just in China, but also across Asia. And also, uh, somebody asked a question, with Hong Kong Stock Exchange also changing its listing rules allow pre-revenue companies, specifically for pre-revenue biotech companies to be listed uh, in Hong Kong. And you can see Asia has become, create its entire ecosystem all the way to capital market to allow uh, biotech innovation to, um, um, to really um, floor it. And uh, as you can see, capital is all also abundant in China. This, um, the venture capital investment specifically uh, to, um, to uh, healthcare has continued to grow at a much faster pace. And I want to emphasize, in addition to venture capital, you both have not-for-profit and, and the government-backed investments. And actually, this didn't mention one thing. A pharma company's investment into early biotech is a lot. It's, it's increasing tremendously. Part of the reason is the Chinese pharma com companies has gone through such a fast evolution. Most of the companies started as a generic company. So what they've done is they established a very established sales force. They essentially have the pipes to all the hospitals. They have the KOL, key opinion leader relationship. They can do clinical trial, except they have no molecule, right? So that's why if you're looking at last couple of years, M&A volume selling into listed pharma companies are tremendous. And they actually willing to pay a very hefty fees. And they are actually the biggest competitor to investors like us because they almost are dumb money, if you will, because they have a synergy, right? They have such a pipeline. And if there is one drug going to them, they can really um, uh, make the sales go up. So that's an important force as well. And then lastly, I would also want to touch upon the R&D uh, outsourcing platforms, um, which you know, before is commonly referred as CROs. Today, they've become so much more. Right? So as you can see, in the 90s, you really have start to emergence of the consolidation of the clinical and preclinical CROs in US and Europe. So just as of 15 years ago, I'm sorry, as of 20 years ago, this was more of a Western phenomenon. Uh, starting from in the, in the 2000s, CROs has been has gone global. Um, they've expanded, and also CROs has expanded. Is um, the the uh, China has become an important supply base. That's one simple uh, you know belief, right? I can arbitrage labor. So if you say the labor arbitrage, if you manufacture toys and assemble iPhones, those are assembly blue color label. There's much more money to be made in arbitrage white color label, right? So, you know, a, a PhD student in China costs a lot less, uh, you know, in comparing to the US. Those are uh, the, the original ideas. But today, they become a lot more, right? Really, uh, the emergence of, I would call it the one stop R&D shop, right? This is what which is trying to become. And then saying, hey, if you give me the essay, you know, I can do that, you know, a million times, right? So more cheaply, more effectively. And by the way, the capability really has expanded tremendously. I mean, they can do, you know, started with, uh, uh, kept with the, the small molecule. Now that entity, you know, which was listed yesterday in Asia, and they can do biologicals. So I just saying one inside story. When we privatized Wuxi PharmaTech, um, you know, from the U.S. market, the bi biologicals, element we back calculated valued at pr practically zero you know people didn't believe they could do biologicals today and that company and as we said um, they probably do as well as uh, anybody else that entity itself is worth 10 billion dollars in hong kong stock exchange right so the capability building tremendous now they're building uh the capability in cell therapy uh you know in all the new and modern stuff uh, really the one-stop shop um you know become uh, possible so to recap, um, the thesis um, is really how do we really drive innovation and translational research through the partnership of different participants in the value chain, right? That includes investors, that includes open R&D platforms, and that includes pharmaceutical companies, and most importantly, the, really, the thought leaders in, acad in, uh, in the centers of academia excellence, such as Yale. I think there is, um, you know, the, the more tighter the partnership will foster, the more efficient the process will be. So I think 
um, just to end, I would say also Asia has become, is ready to embrace this rising opportunity I've I gone through. So really, if we're taking a global perspective, you take across the industry collaboration, that probably is one of the form formulas in addition to more money to make the discovery process and the um, translational process more efficient. So obviously, as we all know, if you have more quantum, which is capital, and they have more efficient research, and hopefully that will be the new paradigm to drive much more efficient and much more productive uh, R&D research, help to reverse that decline in the overall R&D productivity. So I'll end my uh, you know, remarks there and uh, welcome any questions from the audience. Could you please go back to that depressing slide with the decreased uh, productivity per dollar? There were at least two of them. Pick your uh, and, and walk us through a bit more how we can push back on that. This that one. one right there. Uh, next one. This one. Thank you. How do, how do I what? I'm always happy to go. Uh, you, you, You've talked about several ways to innovate. What do you think are the three best levers for reversing that, uh, that linear aggression you have there? Yeah, I, 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 sorry, the talk was more designed for academia. Uh, I think uh, the, if the three levers, one is tighter collaboration of early science with industrial process. You know, specifically, I would say, I'm mean, taking the example, if, if I'm a lab, I've established the essay, instead of hiring 10 graduate students to repeat it, by the way, you can't find those 10 graduate students. If you hire 10 to repeat your essay, they'll be lousy graduate students. They wouldn't come to Yale, right? So, you know, find a, uh, you know, find a, a CRO, for example, to do that. Obviously, there's a lot of intricacies. How do you I structure the IP and all of that? But the easy to think, if a biotech companies can retain all the IP, why couldn't the lab retain all the IP? Right. So that's, uh, that's one of the ways. And second is really you think about this thing, this question globally. How do I leverage uh, a lower cost base? Right. So it's as simple as, you know, that's part of the, you know, if industry as iPhone was assembled in China because of arbitrage labor, well, well you know, R&D labor cost as a percentage of the total input is a lot higher. It's, it's about all labor, right? So why wouldn't that arbitrage, and the cost difference is actually much bigger now today. By the way, in China, the, the facts you probably don't know, a blue collar, a janitor, the salary, and a college graduate's salary is actually, janitor actually now, as my latest statistics, is more than a college graduate. <laughs> it turns out so many college graduate students, um, college graduates, and uh, it's, it's very cheap. I think that would be the, the second one. And third, I think, is really how do you um, design um, the, the collaboration model with multiple centers. I think this requires both pharma and biotech uh, and the academia to collaborate better. So, um, you know, at least this is hope, and we cannot uh, you know, at least you would slow that decline or hopefully, you know, reverse it a little bit. I, I actually have a question. I just use a platform. I'm truly impressed by your proposal of uh, the new style of uh, translation research, namely a three-party collaboration between the creative academics and uh, the effective platform with industrial strength and then also the visionary capital investment. So in, not, in today's case, in US, uh, how do you think, as a capitalist, as an investor, how can you promote that? Yeah, wh one of the things that um, we could do um, is, uh, I think in the very early stage, you also, um, in, in feeling that valley of the death, I think you need both um, the early, early venture and they need a little bit of philanthropic you know, you know, money, right? So because uh, you need both um, the vision, because if you, the, the risk of a university, a single molecule university research is so high, 
and then the you know the the, the venture model, which is diversify risk through multiple assets, is not efficient. It's not it's not wide enough. You know, right? This is if you if you make five percentage shots, you can take twenty companies and hope for one home run. Home run. Now some of it you need to take one percent or 0.1 percentage shot. How do you come to that? So I think that's one more thesis I didn't want to talk about is how do you also organize the philanthropic um, the the world and working together with that and how do the for-profit capitalists and now the good news is um, most of the um, the um, industrial or capitalists also have the second row as a philanthropic Tomasic for example have a five billion dollar Tomasic foundation which you know as a, you know that uh, the, the two rows can come together uh, and then maybe there's certain synergy we can um, discuss around there to help to foster this. I think you really need both ends because the risk of the really single molecule in the early stage in the lab is just too high for um, a, a classic venture to come in. That's part of the reason for the value of the death. But of course, uh, the way if you can increase that percentage shot with the lower input uh, which is the idea of increase the efficiency, and that probably can move the venture capital to an earlier stage as well. Um, uh, go ahead. One last question, and then we'll to the next speaker. Um, just commenting again on this graph. Uh, my guess is, um, I'm representing Takeda Ventures, in terms of the dollar spent and the inefficiency, I think it's really more clinical development expense than the preclinical. So you can definitely gain an efficiency on the discovery side through the, the outsourced model, which Takeda is actually doing a lot of. But I think where the real dollars and the binary risk really gets focused and the inefficiency of what comes out on the end on the approved products is really the lack of translation on the clinical. So of like most stuff doesn't. The, the preclinical does not translate into clinical. And that's it's really absolutely. where where the gap is in the industries. We don't have good models. We don't have a tie-in with patient samples. There are only certain things that can be cultured and you know it's it's horrible when you look at how cell lines and primary cells how they differ. So I think this this un un how unpredictable the discovery into development is 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 where the bottleneck really lies. Yeah, so I agree with that. A lot of dollars is in that. But however, uh, as what we discovered, I personally, my personal belief is a better preclinical results and design, and then also more efficiency in that, as you said, if a cell line, if you can use the same cell line and same person does preclinical all the way through, right? So it will make the efficiency much, much better, which is part of the vision of, of we see, right? Because if you think about classically, you are cell culture taking, you know, in the lab, right? And then in phase one, some biotech companies learn everything you do, right? Instead of a graduate student, and they have a more efficient, but much less efficient than a larger biotech, and they're doing it all, all themselves. They have to go learn the whole thing all, all over again. When you go license again, they have to repeat that whole thing again, right? In some of the early labs, they can't industrially grow the cell lines. They still, you know, have to do it in sort of more of a lab way, right? If you have a one-stop shop going all the way through, really you can say, I'm just, it's the same cell line, same molecule, same process, except for taking it all the way through. The, from all the way preclinical all the way to the uh, clinical trials. I think that is uh, one of the ways that you can, you know, reduce the cost. And also, but eventually when you manufacture it, you have to be in an industrial process, right? So because, you know, think about the, the finally, let, let me put it in this way. If an academic researcher can have the access to the production facility and finally you're going to deliver it to the patient, wouldn't it be much closer to truth? Because at the end of the day, you have to manufacture in the industrial process, which is one of the major failing points of this thing, is how would you know exactly the molecule, the property of the molecule you finally produced in, in uh, you know, going to phase three trial? It's the same as you detect in the lab. You don't really know. Right? So that's why if you're having efficiency, you'd much rather find it early rather than say, I cannot repeat in the industrialized fermenter in, uh, compared to my lab. It has to be I do it vortex myself, which is one of the things I found myself. And that's the, you know, in the early days, that's one of the major problems is how your essay can be repeated when you scale up.
I know there are still hands raising, but because we are slightly late. So on that high efficiency note, let's thank you even again. Thank you. Uh, for those of you who are standing in the back and who are looking for seats, there are more than enough down here in front. And I've been told, um, get them to come down. There are free t-shirts on those chairs. <laughs>